afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Spring 2022 Building Networked Communities Meeting on the topic of Scaling Online Graduate Program Culminating Experiences. Uh, my name is Keith Chandler, and I serve as the event coordinator for the ASU Graduate College. Thank you again for joining us. Also joining us behind the scenes is Matthew Robinson, manager of online learning for uh, the new media team at Ed Plus. Thank you for uh, joining us uh, behind the scenes, Matthew, and making this happen. Um, in just a few moments, I will introduce our moderator and panelists and begin addressing all of the questions that you submitted in advance of today's event. Um, Dean Elizabeth Wentz um, had an enterprise conflict uh, come up today. She was hoping to join us, but unfortunately could not. However, uh, she did want to communicate uh, the following video message outlining the objectives and purpose of uh, today's discussion. Matthew, if you could please share that video. Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming to today's panel discussion to talk about how to scale the culminating experiences for our online graduate programs. All of you know, I know that ASU has been a pioneer in bringing graduate programs online to meet the students where they are. For example, in 2013, ASU hosted 58 online programs, a number that is more than quadrupled in the last nine years to 248. And of course, the number of students enrolled in online programs is mirrored in that number. One of the obstacles that many of our programs face has been figuring out how to provide a meaningful culminating experience for our online programs. Today, our panel here is to discuss what kinds of culminating experiences have and haven't worked for their online students and their online programs so that we can all learn from their experiences and gain some new ideas and some new insights. Of course, my hope is that this discussion will bring general awareness of scaling to online culminating experiences to you. Of course, build a better network community and open up more opportunities for new ideas. Um, I wanna thank our partners, Ed Plus, and Gemma Garcia and Gloria Espinoza from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, without whom this discussion would not be possible. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this event. Um, just a couple of housekeeping reminders. Um, since we are in a webinar setting today, you can see us, but we cannot see you. Uh, we do ask that if you have any questions that arise during today's webinar, please submit those through the Q&A function at the bottom of the, uh, the webinar setting. Um, if we cannot address a question today, we do plan to compile an FAQ document and send this to everyone after the event is complete. And at this time, I would like to introduce our panelists. Um, and our moderator for today's webinar. Uh, joining us is Melissa Rudd, Director of Graduate Student Services with Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College. Uh, Casey Evans, Executive Director of Strategy and Success with Ed Plus. Jeff Kubiak, Professor of Practice in the School of Politics and Global Studies and Senior Fellow with the Center on the Future of War in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. And finally, John Pratt, Senior Director in the Office of Education Innovation in Watts College of Public Service and Community Solutions. And finally, serving as our moderator today is Erica Green, Director of Program and Portfolio Management with Ed Plus. Erica, at this time, I am going to stop my screen and uh, hand it over to you to facilitate today's panel. Erica, it's all yours. Thank you, Keith. As previously mentioned, our topic today is on scaling online graduate program culminating experiences. Before we start our discussion, let me first provide an explanation of how a culminating experience is defined through the ASU graduate college lens. Every graduate degree at ASU requires a culminating experience that includes a written component. A culminating experience is a graduation requirement at the end of the degree that pulls together the coursework and learning outcomes in either a final exam, a culminating course, written document, or a project. To level set on terminology, often the word capstone or thesis is used interchangeably with culminating experience. For our purposes, a capstone refers to an actual permanent numbered course that is taken in the last semester of the program, and a thesis is a final research paper that goes through graduate college format review. The types of culminating events that are currently available at ASU are the capstone course, 
applied project, written comprehensive exam with optional oral component, the portfolio, and two options currently only available in person, which are the thesis and the dissertation. Now that we have ASU's culminating experience defined, it's time to address our panelists. I will direct each question to an individual panelist to start and then open up the discussion to the rest of the panelists for additional feedback. So let's get started. Casey, let's begin with you. With your extensive experience at EdPlus, can you talk a little bit about what it means to scale a program and what you feel are the best types of culminating experiences to scale for online graduate programs specifically? Sure, and thanks for the question, Erica. Um, scale for digital immersion programs means uh, infinite capacity. And I know I say infinite and everyone kind of is terrified, but that's truly what we're trying to build is our ability to provide access to graduate level education at infinite scale or capacity to allow learners to uh, come into the programs and be successful. And that's really what we're trying to achieve. So when we contemplate that as our definition of scale in the digital immersion program portfolio, then thinking about how to create these experiences that help the students to synthesize their learning throughout their degree program is a huge deal and really paramount to creating the structure that you can deploy for academic excellence. What I will say is for the most part, uh, the academic programs that are online have uh, applied projects as their culminating experience or a capstone course that kind of does the same thing. The applied project is uh, used most because I think it allows the learner to really apply their knowledge and most of our degrees are applied. So um, for an example, I completed the digital audience strategy degree uh, in December of 2020. The years kind of blend together now, so I think. Anyway, I completed it. And my final class was uh, an applied project. I had to actually support a marketing strategy for uh, a nonprofit agency and deploy some strategies. The faculty advisor helped us. We had a group that we worked with. And so leveraging groups to really help the knowledge acquisition where learners can work together to think about things differently and kind of level set. And then a faculty to support them is really the best way to do that I think it really worked in our instance and in leveraging the ability to support external agencies through some of the things I think John will bring up uh, later, the partnership with Ripen, the opportunities to create pathways for internship or applied projects are, are interesting. Um, but the goal is that you need to create a structure so that you can make sure that the learners have acquired all the knowledge, that their writing skills um, are up to par and that they are are completing everything that they're required to complete while being able to support it. So having strategies to build scaffolded scale, which Melissa will talk about a little bit, also help. Um, so it really is about creating the right infrastructure to support someone being able to uh, focus their efforts on engaging in the work of the degree making sure that they can actually perform the tasks that they're being required to perform and that they've been taught for the last 18 months. So, yeah. Thanks, Casey. Sure. Uh, are there any other panelists that would like to mention anything about scaling or uh, favorite types of culminating experiences? All right, well, let's move on. Um, Jeff, I have a, my next question is for you specifically. Um, within the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, how do you ensure academic rigor is maintained in online endeavors? Well, I can only speak for our program, the one I co-direct in global security, but the, the, the way we do it is uh, the way you do it in an immersion program through active uh, and engaged faculty. Our program is in global security and the fun, one of the fun, fundamental learning outcomes is an ability to write an argumentative or analytical essay. Uh, so we spend a lot of time through all of our courses actively engaging our students and providing them lots of feedback. And the same is true in our capstone. We run our learning experience at the capstone course, the last course students take, in which they generally do individual projects 
um, that are extended and, and analytical or argumentative essays and or um, extended policy briefs on specific policy topics of their choice. Again, it allows them to do what Casey mentioned, allows them to synthesize their coursework at the same time doing something useful to them as they prepare for their, for, uh, their, um, their degree. In any case, the, the reality of it is, is we've been able to grow our faculty at a pace that allows for active faculty engagement all the way through. So the students are doing these individual projects and getting feedback every single week of the, of the course. The courses are generally kind of run as individuals going through the course, um, but they're engaging one-on-one -on -one with faculty throughout the whole, throughout the entire process, critical for gaining that kind of feedback and, and uh, ensuring learning is being done. Excellent, thank you. Um, I, I appreciate your feedback on academic rigor, especially. I know that's a question that always comes up um, as we start developing programs. Anyone else have any more further feedback on that? I'll just add what Jeff was saying about relevance to the career or the outcomes that they're seeking that they can take and tangibly input. Graduate level learners, I think we all know this, are seeking the ability to leverage that skill immediately and to use it to their advantage. So being able to assure that, create a portfolio of sorts or have it practically applied that they can leverage it meaningfully outside of their education is also supremely important when it comes to developing these um, culminating experiences. Yeah, the other piece on that too is, is a budgetary and planning process, right, to ensure you've got the resources available at the capstone. So our, our professors, we built our faculty such that the capstone course counts as one of their teaching uh, requirements for the year, one of the workload teaching requirements is a capstone supervision of six students so they can monitor, monitor six students you know, in weekly progress through the capstone course, that is one of their teaching requirements. Now, as we built the program, we've been able to keep our faculty resources ahead of the demand for capstone um, supervision, uh, in the growth mode because the resources uh, were out in front of the demand because capstone comes last. As a program levels off in, in uh, plateaus in enrollment or in worst case scenarios de declines, it, uh, it becomes kind of a pinch and we'll get to that in a little bit about what uh, how we solve that problem. Absolutely. Uh, Melissa, I, my next question is, is mostly for you, but we'll open it up to everyone else as well. How large have some online graduate programs in Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College been able to scale and still be successful with culminating experiences? Sure, uh, we'll talk about our largest program. So our largest program is, a, is an MA in special education with a concentration in applied behavior analysis. That program, I ran a report last week, has about 2,700 active students total in the single degree plan. Um, and it offers five starts a year. So we bring students in five times a year. It's designed to be completed in five sequential semesters, which includes a summer term. Um, and it offers a choice in culminating experience. So students can choose between either an applied project or a capstone course. Um, and regardless of their choice, the rest of the degree requirements are the same. So there's not a curricular difference outside of the course they choose as their culminating experience. Um, you know, it's very successful with culminating experience. We have about 600 students that are enrolled for the spring B um, culminating experiences. A little more than half are an applied project. The rest are in the capstone course. Um, and that, that's similar to what we see in most terms going back about a year. Um, we offer culminating experience three times a year in spring B, summer B, fall B. So it's very predictable and cyclical. Um, and the program does a fabulous job of kind of scaffolding students through that process. So students enter into one of three foundational courses, and then they progress through the program in a prescribed sequence that really kind of guides them and sets them up for success once they get to that culminating experience. So do you find that um, with your scaffolding process that having specific courses offered in a cohort is more beneficial to you overall for scaling? Um, I mean, I think we definitely find that having students enter into that foundational block is really key. Um, you know, students in this particular program are generally practitioners in the field already in some format, but they may have various um, degree of time in field and awareness of the field in general experience, if you will. So it really does help level set them for the rest of the program, gets them all on the same page around terminology and core concepts, things of that nature. Um, and then 
students uh, take courses in a different order because they enter our program, we carousel our courses. So they enter at a different place, but it's always a foundational course. Um, so that has really helped, I think, students be successful. The word carousel gets used quite often with our online programs. Would you be able to explain that a little more as far as how you carousel your courses? Sure. So our courses are offered 10 classes in this program. It's a 30 credit master's degree. Um, and those courses are offered in a 10 course sequence. Um, and students join the program at a point in time in which those courses are offered. So students who join us in fall have a different first course than students who join us in spring A. Um, but, and then that sequence is the same for all of those students who join at the same time. So it's different than like a cascade or a waterfall. Um, in our program, most students are in one of two classes. So about half our program is taking a course at the same time. Um, and then the other half of the program is in a different course. And then they follow that carousel kind of around the wheel as it were. Melissa, there's a question in the chat that asks how many faculty you need to supervise 600 culminating experiences. Yeah, so um, for our courses, we do a staffing model that has a lead faculty. Um, it's one course section for a, for an applied project, for example. We have a lead faculty member, and then we have a number of co-instructors. So students are actually grouped into much smaller clusters, about 20 students, 25 students. Um, to a faculty member. So one class is gonna have quite a number of co-instructors to ensure that they're getting really good instructional support and one-on-one -on -one time with faculty and they're getting all the feedback that they need in order to be successful. So it looks and feels to students and to the instructors much like um, a, a traditional course section would look and feel. That's great. Thank you so much for that information. Is there anyone else that had anything they wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on what Melissa presented there. Uh, you know, when we initially started some of our programs here in Watts College, specifically the Masters of Social Work program and also our Emergency Management and Homeland Security program, um, there was a significant amount of research that went into how we went about designing the overall program itself. And certainly we give a lot of credit to Teachers College because we adopted a variation on a theme for their, uh, their scaling, the way that they scale their programs and so forth. Um, but for us, uh, the carousel method, as much as it helps to make things predictable and so forth, it did not work for us in the sense that you know, because of our uh, requirements and prerequisites and so forth, we had to have a structured timeline. So we did kind of a variation on a theme, but we certainly uh, uh, adopted how the, the courses are designed and the way that the, the, the co-instructors are uh, scaled um, as more and students enroll in the program so that we can ensure that the students are uh, still meeting the, 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 the student to teacher ratio. So we, um, what I would say is that uh, it, the uh, how a program goes through and ultimately meets meets their culminating experience really depends on how the overall program is designed, how it's staffed, and ultimately what the leadership uh, decides is best within their budgets uh, as well. It's really a systems approach to it. Absolutely, agreed. Jeff, um, how do you streamline the submission and evaluation process for an online project or portfolio to reduce the time required from faculty and staff each semester? Well, first, we, we created a, obviously a Canvas course for the Capstone project, and we've created intermediate requirements along the path to a completed project. Uh, faculty can, uh, so students are aware of what deadlines they have, how to, how to meet their milestones along the way. Faculty can provide feedback at, at the scheduled um, inter intermediate points. The problem becomes, of course, um, as we, as you, as the, as the program grows, and the question that showed up in the chat: How do you? Isn't it? Isn't it tough to maintain that kind of one-on-one -on -one relationship? And it, and it is. So as we uh, look forward to the future, we're, st we're still continuing to look at potential for growing um, the number of group projects that are done, which actually enables us to engage. One, it does a couple things. One, it enables us to engage generally external agencies that are working in the field of security. 
uh, to do real real world projects for them. And we have done that in the past with Special Operations Command and uh, US Army's uh, Network Operations Command. So we've done several of those kinds of things. We're gonna to continue to grow that. And somebody mentioned Ripen before. I know that Ripen is ASU is contracted with them now to help provide um, commercial and or private sector parties to uh, submit projects for completion in capstones. Group projects become a little bit easier for faculty to oversee as a lot of the expertise then comes from the external agencies. So I think going forward, that's where we're headed with, with much of our capstone work um, beyond what we already do with the individual written products. Great, thank you. And Melissa, did you have anything else you wanted to add to that as well? Um, you know, I think then something that came up for our um, MA in special education degree program recently, a specific to applied project, was that um, the faculty are really looking at ways that they can pull forward some of the planning that goes into applied project as students get ready to enter that experience, specifically around matching students intentionally with specific co-instructors if they know the kinds of projects students are looking to do. And I think we're always looking for ways to enhance that experience to make it as contextually um, appropriate and personable and personalized for students as we can, um, which can be challenging in a large program, but it's it's possible. I think it's just about how we plan and, and adapt and iterate on what we've done so far. Absolutely. I can add to say, I mean, I think that's a really good point, Melissa, about, about contextualizing the capstone for students too. We have a, a pretty broad range of interest within, within the student body in our program. Um, and we have a very broad, broad range of expertise within the program. And so we have one in one faculty member actually serve as the advisor or overseer of the capstone course who works very hard with students prior to the launch of the capstone course to line up student interests with faculty expertise to the max extent possible. And then we make a lot of our part-time professors of practice, many of whom are very big names in the business of security, available as subject matter experts down the road as well. Great, thank you both. Anyone else before we- Yeah, I, I just wanna add something about group projects because we hear a lot um, about, especially from the learners, that they don't love working in groups and that groups are frustrating, but that is true of life and work and the way the world works. So actually, you know, the, the learning from that is how do you work within a group, which becomes the secondary learning for the applied project is not only how do you apply it, but how do you apply it in a diverse setting with different people that you're not accustomed to working to with. Um, it is always challenging, so I don't want to take away from that because it always is. Um, but one of the things you learn quickly in digital immersion is, actually this is true of life, so this is just a life lesson. Sometimes you have to do more than you think you should, and sometimes you have to step up in ways you didn't think you would need to. And I think group projects also add that co-curricular lens of how do I work with different people at different way, in different ways, which adds another layer of, of interest to the learner. Even if, even if they hate it every step of the way, I think they do learn something from group projects that are really tactically beneficial. Yeah, and we had another question coming in chat, which kind of relates to this, and I think we have some time to answer it. So um, I'll just ask it at this point. How is teaching credit allocated? And do leads and co-instructors all get full teaching credit? No one wants to answer the teaching credit question. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll just I'll just chime in real quick and just say um, that that uh, it just really depends on the program itself uh, and how it's designed, uh, what their budgetary allocations are, uh, and ultimately, um, uh, what's important is how everything ties up to any of the accrediting bodies and so forth. So it's 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 across the board as far as um, you know how teaching credit is applied. There are some programs that you must have a tenured track faculty member teaching a course and it could have a thousand students in that course. There are other, other programs that do not have that uh, requirement and you can have uh, adjuncts who are very skilled from their experience in the real world to come in and teach that at the same time. It is, it is uh, vastly across the board and it really does come down to the overall design of the program itself and what the administration and the faculty governance uh, feel is important for that program. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. 
Um, and going right back to you, uh, in your experience in Watts College of Public Service and Community Solutions, do you find that scaling a culminating experience for an online program is more difficult or about the same as an immersion program? Well, I, I would say that uh, anytime you add more people to an equation, it's going to be a little bit more difficult, uh, no matter what. Um, but I think the, the most important part of any kind of uh, uh, program that you put together is the people that you have involved. Uh, we're just really um, um, lucky, I think, in many respects, much like my, my colleagues here on this panel, to have some exceptional leadership uh, and faculty and the faculty governance uh, to come together and regularly review their processes for how they go about designing their program um, and what leads to the culminating experience. And I, and I do want to add one thing as it's related to the culminating experience that was in the definition of it from a, from a university standpoint uh, that Casey had mentioned at the beginning of the program is that yes, we do have programs that have portfolio requirements, um, but uh, we do also have programs and specifically our masters in social work where uh, you could venture to say that the culminating experience is also their, their field experience as well. The significant amount of hours that they actually have to um, to put into the field as part of their uh, master's in social work program. Uh, if they don't get these, uh, that, that component done, they don't graduate. That is critical to, to, their, to the importance of it. And so uh, when it comes to thinking about how you, uh, you design for that, how you manage that, um, you think about the whole, the, the whole experience of going through the program. You, you started from the beginning where we have our first course is really an intro to the program. What are the requirements for the program? How do you go about um, um, finding your internships in the field? How do you register within the um, uh, the, dat the database, which manages all of the internships? And and by the way, that was has, is a critical component to how we manage our internships. Is this uh, database called Sonia, uh, in which uh, students submit. Uh, they can find actually the more that students participate in the system, the more students we have go through the system, the more possible agencies that students have uh, to look for within the system and to to register within Connecticut or Maine or Washington. Uh, so that becomes infinitely more um, accessible and more um, beneficial as the, the program goes on. Uh, and so it's uh, the system itself is helping to manage that process of uh, helping students identify their agencies, uh, helping to uh, procure the right permissions. And there's contracts that have to be signed, uh, uh, signed by ASU and the agency itself. Um, so that's a really important part of it. And when that's all introduced in the first course of the program, in addition to an overall program resource site that the entire uh, uh, MSW students have access to. So it's that from beginning to end, here's the process for, for participating in the internships. And also here are the requirements for meeting, um, uh, for participating and ultimately completing their culminating experience in the final course of their MSW program as well, which is ultimately a portfolio that they have to put together. It's not a physical portfolio. It's not a paper portfolio. It's a digital portfolio. And that's something that, um, that has benefited not only the online MSW, but also uh, the other uh, programs within our college that benefit from portfolios as well. Um, our PAC portfolio, the po Policy Advocacy and Community uh, Masters in Social Work program was an entirely paper-based portfolio until we had systems come on board that allowed us to manage all of that within a digital environment. And you can only imagine how beneficial that is during the COVID era right now. So um, all this is to say it's, it's a system. Uh, you think about it from beginning to end and going through the entire program, what can help those students to prepare themselves, uh, one, for their final uh, culminating experience, whether it's a portfolio or a thesis, uh, and number two, you know, how do you manage field experiences, internships, using a field office that has uh, potentially upwards of a thousand students participating in the field experiences at any given uh, given time? And they, it's been absolutely incredible. The last thing I'll mention is that uh, I myself is in a uh, uh, received my graduate degree in an online program. I did one of these programs where I had to develop a portfolio at the, at the end. The first course in the program was teaching me through all the requirements for the program, 
Uh, I had to develop an initial template for my portfolio. And I said, what the heck am I doing here? Why am I doing all this right now? And then once I got to the end, it made all the sense in the world. So it was an entire systems approach uh, for me to understand what it was that I was actually doing and advocate for um, that culminating experience. Thanks, John. Um, I'm sure there will be some some people contacting you later about the internship program that you use. That seems like it's it makes it much more efficient and uh, builds upon itself, which is excellent. Uh, we do have a question from the audience that is related to this as well, kind of based more on digital portfolios. For those whose programs use digital portfolios, are you all using Digication? Are there other good digital portfolio options that work well? I will, uh, I'll jump into that uh, first. Um, I would say that uh, for some of our programs, we initially started off with Digication. And in those programs, we still offer that as an option. Uh, the challenge that we've had with it has been uh, the user experience is, you know, getting used to the environment, understanding how to use the tool, uh, even when uh, the, uh, uh, the, port, the program has been set up to actually have a template that they could simply adopt and just kind of fill in the blanks from there is still proven challenging. So um, uh, I, I would venture to say that uh, user interface design is incredibly important when it comes to any kind of uh, uh, design work. Uh, and so for that reason, we're trying out different things. It's not to say that digication isn't working. It still does work in many respects, and we'd still have programs that use it. Uh, but we are, we are piloting uh, as technology improves uh, the use, for example, Google Sites, you know, and how those are really easy to build. You have Google Drive, you have YouTube, you have all these Google products that can really uh, interface together uh, as possible solutions. There's also Wix, there's Weebly, uh, and so forth and so on. We're trying, we're trying to introduce uh, items that they we think might prove to be a little bit easier to use for the students, but it does create an additional layer of um, orientation and training for the students to get used to those environments as well. Makes sense. Anyone else yeah. have any feedback on that? I think ideally, just from a learner perspective, the goal is always to meet the learner where they're at. I think we mentioned that at the beginning, but when you introduce technology, particularly if the interface is not as smooth as it could be, and it's not easy to figure out, then you just put an additional and undue burden on the learner to figure out the technology in order to do the work, which makes it way harder. I agree with John that I have seen a, a bend toward using a Google suite because students are really familiar with it already. And so it makes it much easier for them to deploy and, and get their stuff uploaded without trying to figure out how education works. So yeah, I think it, it really is about what's best for the needs of the unit and the needs of the learner. Um, but this is true of all technology integration when we think about the classroom, right? It looks beautiful and shiny and we implement it and the students are like, no, I'm not gonna do this. So just thinking about that piece is important. Agreed. Okay, uh, moving on to our next question. Melissa, what advising strategies are effective for helping students prepare, prepare for culminating experience courses at scale? And how do you effectively track and manage enrollment eligibility for them? Yeah, this is a topic I'm particularly passionate about. Um, and John alluded to this before, but it really is about thinking about systems. And in this context, we're thinking about student support systems. So um, for some context in Teachers College, we have a centralized professional staff advising team that provides kind of traditional academic advising support to students in our master's programs, graduate certificate programs. And we are structured in teams and we didn't always used to be structured in teams. A couple of years ago, we were in a pretty traditional advisor student caseload model where a, an advisor might have their own caseload of 500 or so students um, when we consider our larger program. Um, and we found as that program continued to scale that that advising model was not scalable. Um, we were running into a lot of problems of having to reassign students, um, issues of, you know, if advisors got promoted or if they had um, another opportunity, having to reassign advisors to students, things of that nature was really hard to scale um, and keep on top of with larger 
programs. So we adopted a team approach a couple of years ago where we have, um, if we use our large program as the example, we have two teams of three advisors um, supporting that program. Each team has roughly half the population. And then we have a coordinator senior who serves as a team lead for both teams. Um, and the teams really holistically support students from an advising capacity. So it's not you know, a group of 1500 students divided amongst three advisors. It's really those three advisors coming together to support students as they work their way through the program. And that creates a support system for these students where if we have day-to-day -day advising needs that are happening right now, if we use right now as the example, we're preparing for fall registration to open and students who are gonna be ready for culminating experience in fall, a member of that team can actually peel off and do a lot of that administrative back end work without it having any impact to the service that the students are getting who have ongoing needs in the current term um, or other advising things that need to happen. So it's really seamless and it provides some kind of structural redundancy. And it gives the advisors an opportunity to really make decisions and, and design how to support the students in their program based on what's happening in that program's context. What's coming up? What do the students need? What are they hearing from their students? And it gives us a flexibility um, and an agility that we just didn't have in prior advising models. So we're structured in that way. Um, we do use reports and the iPods. They are amazing tools. Um, and we have amazing colleagues in the university that help us continue to evolve and adapt those tools to align with our structure and our strategy. Um, but our teams do use also a manual tracking sheet. So the teams all have a tracking sheet that has their entire caseload, all 1500 students on it. Um, and collectively as a team, they have agreed to how they note and update and manage that sheet. But what it does is it allows us to feed all the different points of information, reports, the iPods, things we know that we're hearing from students. Some, somebody got an incomplete or they're taking a leave of absence or they had to alter their course sequence. And at a glance, the advisors can filter and know exactly who's planning to be in culminating experience in a forward term, who should be eligible. So that gives us the population that needs double checking. Do they have an iPods on file? Have they passed all their classes? Did they take all their classes? All the things that we check um, in a way that's much more efficient than trying to just check every student one by one. Um, or if a student failed to do an iPods, we might miss them, you know, things of that nature. Um, and then we use department consent um, as a prerequisite or requirement for most of our culminating experience courses. We do this in the large scale program. Um, and essentially what we do, again, trying to be planful and thinking ahead, we just went through this for summer, is before the schedule opens in PeopleSoft, we do all the work around double checking the students, seeing who should be eligible for culminating experience in the forward term. And in that pocket we get where the schedule opens and before registration opens, we place all the overrides. So that as soon as registration opens, students can go ahead and add culminating experience if they're ready to enroll. It's done a lot to save us, um, you know, kind of extra, advising inquiries and then the students that reach out to us are the ones we really need to answer us and talk to us around doing an iPods or addressing um, something that might have happened in a prior course or things of that nature. Um, so that's kind of technically how we do that. And then again, this program has a choice of culminating experience. So we do do a lot of um, prep work early in the program as well. We encourage students to do the iPods early, which would help them map out their program well in advance. Um, and our faculty have created really great resources to help advisors um, help students navigate a choice. What's the difference between applied project and the capstone course? And why might I choose one over the other? Um, so we have some video assets and we have some preset language and talking points that we can use that really help students navigate that choice so that um, one, we can treat each student question like it's the first time we're hearing it so that the student feels like they're getting the attention that they need and they don't feel like we're working with several thousand of them at once. Um, and 
the advisors have tools that allow them to work very quickly and efficiently. Um, so they're not trying to find or recreate or articulate something without some tools and resources. That's great. Um, this also prompted a question from the audience. Uh, what is your staffing level? And do you have an estimate of your student to advisor ratio? Sure. So we're extremely fortunate. We have a very supportive college um, and leadership in our college in terms of staffing to account for scale. Um, but if we use that at the MA Special Education Applied Behavior Analysis Program as the example, again, it has 2,700 students in the master's degree. These advisors also support the graduate certificate, so in the same content area. So altogether, it's approximately 3,000 students. Um, and we have six advisors across two teams. So one team has, I think right now, about 1,600 students, and the other team has the remainder. So that's, that's what, approximately 500 to one. Um, but it's, it really truly functions like 1600 to three. Um, now using, we have other online programs. So, you know, we have another team of, of two advisors who support most of our other um, online programs that don't lead to teacher certification or principal certification or non-licensure programs. Um, the two of them support almost a thousand students across the two of them. And they have a, a large range of programs that individually are much smaller in comparison. The largest is around 250, I think. Um, and then a lot of them sit at around the 75 to 150 student range in each program. And then we have another team of three that supports about a thousand students roughly all of our licensure programs. They have a slightly smaller ratio and I'm using air quotes because it's not really a one-to-one -one. because of the nuanced nature of teacher certification and professional licensure that comes along with those programs. It requires some additional attention um, that, that requires additional staffing. Um, so that's, that's how we're staffed. Um, and like I said, every team has a team lead. So we do have um, three advising coordinators as well that support those teams. Um, my team also has two assistant directors, one that works um, generally with, with each of our two academic units, um, one for teacher preparation, one for educational leadership and innovation. And she also supports our, our admission team. Um, we have a admission team that's part of my department that does all of our um, application file processing for master's and graduate certificate students. That's great. We, we did get another question. I think you just answered it. I, would you consider your admissions team like your recruitment team? They're different, actually. Okay. So um, for our online programs, we work with our Ed Plus and Pearson partners. Um, we also do have a recruitment team that supports all of our immersion programs. So my team really focuses on application submission to matriculation. Um, and the recruitment team focuses on kind of the front end of that pipeline until the student submits an application. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Lots of great information there. Uh, let's move on to the written compo component of the culminating experience. Casey, is that handled differently in the online sphere versus immersion in various colleges? And if there is an oral component of the online culminating experience, how has it been addressed or set up? Um, it's really not that different, right? Written is written, whether it's on campus or online, it's the same. Uh, for oral, with the expansion of Zoom, uh, it has become much easier for, I think, academic units to see the opportunity to leverage oral. But before that, I mean, in courses, you can use recording software to upload documentation and upload some of your um, statements. So you could you could do it before Zoom, but, but now they have the opportunity to do it with an audience, to submit it separately. So I think all of the technology we have integrated into our classrooms and available to us has allowed us to really equally measure written and oral communication when it comes to delivering these. Now, obviously, <clears throat> sorry, Phil is talking. There are some nuances to the oral, meaning there's not an audience, but you can do it with a Zoom and have an audience. You just won't have the person standing up in front of the room at a podium and getting super nervous. I think people are so comfortable on Zoom, it lends to actually a better result. So yeah, there's not really a big difference and uh, there shouldn't be. We can deliver 
equally to both. Any other feedback on this topic? I would just uh, kind of support what Casey is saying there. Uh, you know, over the past two years with Zoom, uh, the advent of the various apps within our phones and so forth, it's becoming uh, so much easier to record ourselves and our day to day lives. Um, you know, whether it's related to culminating experiences or not, uh, you know, uh, specifically, for example, with the MSW program, they, they have to show evidence of being able to, you know, interview potential clients. Uh, and so this can be done in their homes, they can do this via Zoom, uh, and, it, and it can all really be done in the palm of your hand these days. And it's really proven to be uh, much easier to do that. It's not to say that it's exactly the same as doing it in the classroom environment, um, uh, but it certainly uh, made it a lot easier to be able to do that. When we were prepping for this, I called it the TikTok, you know, of education, sort of, where you can record anything. You can have a conversation without talking to someone in person and recording on Marco Polo. Like, there's so many things you can do, and we're so accustomed to them now in the world um, because of what's happened in the last two years that I think it just makes it more even playing field and creates a better, at least security for the faculty to understand that those are quality and that we're, we're kind of overcoming the hurdle of campus versus online. Um, it, does, it does introduce its own challenges at the sure. same time, you know, the cat right walking in front of the screen, uh, the background music because your roommate uh, is doing, uh, is doing, a nut, doing something else, you know, so you have to prepare for those kind of things. The other, yeah. the other thing it does too, and it was mentioned before, I think with, with regards to technology is the, the diversity in the student body in an online programs fundamentally different in a lot of ways in graduate programs that are immersion on ground. And you have to account for that. And not everybody's a digital native. So if you're going to use technology, you've got to either lay it out super simple, you know, for all, for all students, or in, you have to make it available, or you may have to make options available because there are cases too where you have different disabilities or whatever else you have to make different options available too. So you have to, there's, there's, there's other caveats that have to go along with that, I suppose. Yeah, I think choice is a big piece here, right? Providing multiple opportunities could help to alleviate some of those burdens as well. Um, but it's a great point that it comes with its own set of, of issues. Yes, for sure. All right, we're going to move on to our last question that's open to all the panelists. If we have any time at the end, we'll answer some of those other questions that came up from the uh, participants in the audience. Um, but if not, we'll be able to answer them uh, in the FAQ at the end. So our question, final question to the group today is, if you had one piece of advice you would give to an academic unit that is thinking about adding a graduate program online and trying to determine what their culminating experience would be, what advice would you give and why? Um, I'll start. Oh, oh go, go ahead, ahead John. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I would say, uh, and this just comes from my background, uh, as far as the culminating experience is concerned, uh, don't lose track of the performance outcome. Uh, and, and that is to say, don't let, uh, the technology drive the decision that you're uh, and how you're going to uh, meet the culminated experience. If there's a specific uh, goal you're trying to meet, um, have the technology adapt to that, not the other way around. Uh, you don't want to lose sight of the fact that um, uh, you're trying to teach these students to be professionals in the, in the realms in which they are they're studying right now. And the best thing they can do is replicate that, that environment to the best extent possible within their performance environment. So I would say don't lose track of that. I'm a little more pro programmatic, I suppose, in, in my answer, uh, having basically um, helped build this program from the ground up and being one of the central pieces in the programmatics in terms of budgeting and projection and faculty hiring and that sort of thing. Don't underestimate, underestimate the resources required for that last component. Um, as you scale up, especially that's going to be true, but, uh, it's easy to kind of get yourself started in developing courses and, and getting teachers assigned to courses. And the next thing you know, you've got 15 or 20 or 30 or 300 or 600 students showing up at the culminating experience. And you've got to figure out how to, how to manage those resources. Our program has a fairly substantial, um, 
uh, program fee, not exorbitant, but it's substantial enough that we've been able to kind of manage that um, as we went along. But I can tell you right now, I don't, we didn't know what that looked like when we first started. And we ended up having to build that airplane in flight, which is an uncomfortable feeling. Um, we've been able to, to succeed. And I think we could scale our program up uh, a fair bit further under the current model. Of course, at some point in time, I think we'd have to change the model once you get to the scale that both John and Melissa talk about. But um, don't underestimate the resources required in coordination and in uh, and, and building out those learning opportunities. Yeah, and you know, my lens is a little different because I really come from the advising background. Um, so this is less about how to, you know, choose a culminating experience, but more about thinking about that entire experience that a student's going to have. And something that um, I think is a big lessons learned for us that we've learned over time is to constantly ask ourselves if what we're doing right now is working and if it's going to continue to work if we were to grow at X, Y, Z percent. Um, and it's not just about having those conversations, I think, amongst a leadership team or just with faculty, but to, act, to also include everybody who works with students in that. So I find I'm constantly asking advisors on the team, um, what are your pain points? What's not working well? Where are you getting hung up? Um, where are the places where we miss students? Um, that maybe should have been ready for culminating experience and weren't, um, or vice versa? Um, and how do we fill those gaps? And it's ironic in a way that we're having a conversation about culminating experience today because right after summer registration opened, a member of my team came to me and said, there has to be a different way for us to do this other than department consent because this is so manual and it's so many and I just don't know if we can keep doing this this way. So I think being open to continuing to have those conversations constantly for a little while or for a long while um, is really important to being able to be adaptable and flexible and have that elasticity that you need when you scale. I think my final plug on that on that on this point um, Erica would be um, you know either get lucky or get good at hiring really good people because this program our program doesn't happen in any way shape or form without the support of our our miracle, our miracle worker Leah leg the program coordinator and it doesn't happen without the hiring of good faculty who are super engaged and wanting to see the program grow so it's it's uh there's a there's a big big piece of it that like i said it might be luck or serendipity or whatever but i'm hoping it's uh that, that folks have the same kind of of uh, situation we find ourselves in Great, thank you all. Uh, we have two minutes left. Are, are there any examples of culminating projects that you might be able to, to mention here today before we finish this? I actually think we can get a list of them and examples from Jeff and Melissa and John and share them um, so that we can collect them. And then the, the second question on that was whether or not they're standardized, uh, meaning, uh, are they the same for every learner that goes through uh, the MAGS program, for example, or Watts? I know, Melissa, you said there's two paths, but those paths are standard paths. Like they are the same, either when you choose, it's the same always. You mean in terms of- um, Like if you do an applied project, then the curriculum is standardized on the applied project. What you have to do is always the same. Your project yeah. may differ, but the expectations Correct. are the same. Yeah, it follows a, a syllabus that outlines what those expectations are. Yeah. And ours are not. Ours are very individually oriented. So whatever the needs of the student are, the instructor generates, can generate requirements uh, or alleviate requirements based on what the student needs to get to an end product that is uh, of, of the highest caliber. How would you feel about that if you had 600 students in your culminating experience, Jeff? I did mention that if we did, <laughs> if we did uh, scale up to a level, like I said, where John and Melissa are, we would have to modify that. Our, our program was actually built, we built our model on being able to scale up to maybe a 300 person student body, we're at about 170 and we're comfortably working within our model and we could comfortably work within our model for another couple hundred students if we continue to increasing enrollments, which we hope to. Uh, once we got past that, we would have to reconsider for and restructuring. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, starting out a program, um, with one model and having to switch as you scale up, I think is maybe an approach that, well, I don't know. 
I think it's appropriate. I hope it's appropriate because that's what our, that's our intention. I think it absolutely is. And I think it goes back to the, the major point, which is to begin with the end in mind. As long as you know what you want the learners to achieve, you can design a bunch of things that help them to deliver that. Um, and it can change as you scale and as you grow to infinite capacities per our, our guidelines, right? I would say that uh, in any in any kind of program with a culminating experience, there's always going to be a framework for how that culminating experience uh, uh, completes. Um, how students, you know, complete that, what the requirements of it can be vary a little bit, or the examples that they include in their culminating experience can vary. Um, and what I would say is that sometimes it's challenging for new students who come in to understand exactly uh, what a portfolio or a thesis might look like or something along those lines. And so therefore in the past, with express permission of past students, we have presented the, what a portfolio might look like to them saying, don't use this, this is an example, but here's what something can look like. You know, we we, we kind of do the same thing. We make, we've made a couple adjustments. One is we make a list of all the capstone projects. We, so we have a kind of a catalog of the, of the, of the titles of our capstone projects. Um, available to the students to look at. But we also started as a cap, we call it a capstone showcase. Uh, and at the end of each semester, uh, fall, spring and summer, we do a, a brief one hour uh, event where we pick the five best capstone projects and have them present a five minute talk on their capstone and, and, and uh, make them available for question and answer afterwards, showcasing the work that our students are doing. And that's been enormously successful. And again, scaling up to 600 students or a thousand students might be a little bit more difficult. Um, but in this situation, as you're growing, it, it really highlights the, the high quality of work and the diversity of the student body, which I think is really super interesting. All right. Well, what an absolutely great discussion today on uh, scaling and culminating experiences with graduate programs. I want to thank all of the panelists here today, Melissa, Casey, Jeff, and John, for sharing your wisdom and best practices on this panel. And thanks also to the audience for your questions and participation. Uh, at this time, I will pass it back to Keith for any closing words. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Erica. And once again, to our panelists for uh, joining us today. And thanks again to all of you and also our partners at the College and Ed Plus. Um, as we mentioned a few times, we will be compiling and sending an FAQ document uh, that you will receive here in the, uh, the coming days. Um, and also we can provide the recording for today's event as well, just in case you had any colleagues that were interested in attending um, and they, uh, they couldn't be with us today. Um, and of course, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to send a message to grad-gps at asu.edu. Thank you again for joining us and have a great rest of your day.